Every year, the Holy Land attracts millions of pilgrims from around the world. It is a special place for Christians, Jews and Muslims. What an average pilgrim is not aware of, however, is that this land became a promised land for hundreds of thousands of refugees from Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, the Philippines and India. Israel, and particularly its capital, Tel Aviv, is a place where they would like to start a new, safe life. Tel Aviv was a city that was built predominantly with the vision of being a secular Jewish city. It was founded in 1909 by Jews who came here from predominantly from Eastern Europe. And uh, with that vision of being a secular city and for Jews, of course, there are no churches in Tel Aviv. But as Tel Aviv became the center of the Israeli economy, it attracted a migration of people who came to work and people who came to seek asylum. Within the last 10 years, about 63,000 economic migrants and asylum seekers flowed out from Asia and Africa to Israel. The vast majority who entered the country before the end of 2012, when a five-meter steel fence sealed off Israel's border with Egypt, were Eritrean and Sudanese. These refugees have every reason to escape from both countries. The ongoing local political and social situations there are dramatic. The United Nations reports show that in South Sudan alone, almost 7 million people are in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. As far as Eritrea is concerned, the country is based on the absolute control of all citizens by the security apparatus. It is one of the world's most repressive regimes, being accused of crimes against humanity. Extrajudicial killings, widespread torture, sexual slavery and enforced labour are on the agenda. 250,000 out of the 6 million inhabitants are under an obligatory, unlimited military service. More than 3 million men and women can be incorporated into the army at any moment, regardless of age or sex. Like every citizen of Eritrea, I was in the military service at war, risking my life. They mistreated me physically. Some men serve in the military armless or without legs. My situation is better. I have my entire body. Faced with a seemingly hopeless situation, Eritreans feel powerless to change their fate. The military conscription, combined with the cruelty present in the army, is the most common cause of escapes from the country. My last 10 years over there were the most terrible thing which a man can experience. I decided to leave my country and try a different life. After my escape, my wife was denied the access to ration food and other basic necessary things for living, namely sugar and oil. Refugees, in order to achieve their desired goal, the promised land to which they tied such big hopes, must overcome thousands of kilometers through Sinai. They wander on foot, sometimes in enormous heat, without food or drink. However, as they admit to themselves, these are not the biggest dangers waiting for them on their way. I have walked on foot for 10 days to Sudan, 
where I stayed eight months. From there, I came to Libya. Then, we were arrested for eight months. We managed to escape and arrived to southern Egypt by foot. Then, some people took us to a big car and brought us to Mount Sinai. The Sinai region became, for many refugees, the dead end of their journey to freedom. The situation was extremely difficult. While arrested, we had our feet shackled. I experienced terrible things, worse than an animal, which even animals should not experience. I saw with my own eyes the inhuman treatment and I thought I would not go through it at all. The life at Sinai was terribly frightening. We have seen terrible things. There was nothing to eat, and some detained died. There was a chain of human trafficking, and many of them, they were tortured for ransom. The traffickers, they were kidnapping and selling them to the Rashaida first in Sudan, and then to the Bedouins in, in Egypt. They were used to get money from, by, by smuggling people, smuggling drugs, smuggling things. So they start to kidnap people and sell them for 40, 50,000 dollars. The first thing they do is they try to work out who is related to who. So they say, ah, okay, great. Here is a daughter and this is her father. Okay, daughter, father. They say to the father, we'll help you get over to Israel. So they take the father and they get him over the border. Very often, they even give him a telephone and they give his daughter a telephone. So he goes over to Israel and then they say, okay, you want to see your daughter again? You need to get to us. $40,000. You go over and you work. When you have sent us $40,000, we will send your daughter. And why the telephone? So that the father does not forget. And if they don't pay, they torture them until they pay. They were suspended um, from the ceiling, upside down. Some of them, they were uh, tight. They lost their fingers and hands. Many died during the torture. Some remain uh, depressed and uh, unable to do anything. They were burned with plastic bags, with electric. I saw women burn the whole body with diesel. And some of them, they were burned only their hair. It's horrible, it's horrible, really. Many die in the Sinai Desert. A few, however, risking their lives, managed to arrive in Israel. And here, new bad experiences await them. Since 2009, Israel has recognized none of the Sudanese asylum applications. Only four Eritreans have received a positive reply. Thousands were either deported or received a temporary permit. They risk an expulsion from Israel at any moment. The police regularly carry out checks of Africans in the streets. They are asked to show a proof of purchase of a telephone or a bike. If not, the immigrant may be accused of stealing. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calls Africans arriving in Israel a threat to the social fabric of society, national security, national identity, and the existence of a Jewish and democratic state. Then... After a very difficult experience in the Sinai, I did not expect such a difficult turn of life in Israel. It is better not to say anything or not to describe our life in Israel, not speaking about Israel as the country in general. They control us by all means. How I'm dressed, where my wife is, if we're lucky, we hope that we will leave Israel alive without any accidents. In this country, there is nothing good for us. According to the Human Rights Watch report, 
The government in Tel Aviv created such complex legislation procedures that the refugees from Eritrea and Sudan have no chance of receiving refugee status. They are sent to a camp in the middle of the Negev desert, called Holot, for an indefinite detention. that they can go out, but they have to sign three times per day. So it's more stressful because they cannot go the whole day and come out to work. And the nearest place is 80 kilometers. Their health is not being taken care of, particularly if they're sick. But the worst of all, there's nothing to do. These are thousands of young men who are confined to a camp or to a very small area in the middle of nowhere. And what do they do the whole day? People detained at Holot can come and go, but they must sign in at night and sleep there, making it impossible to stray far or hold jobs. The winters are bitter cold and summer temperatures can soar to 40 degrees Celsius. Inmates sleep 10 people to a room, all sharing a single bathroom. The authorities are doing this to encourage the people to go back to where they came from. They are not wanted here. They are described in the official media as infiltrators who have come here to work. There's no recognition of the fact that Sudan is a terrible place. Eritrea is an even worse place. People are running for their lives and coming to ask for asylum. In Israel, refugees who, in accordance with international law, should be granted a refugee status are not treated as asylum seekers and have no rights. In most cases, they do not have any official documents. This means that they cannot work legally and their arrest is more than possible. In most countries, asylum seekers get a positive reply. 83% of Eritreans and 67% of Sudanese going through asylum screening are accepted as refugees. So the Israelis say, you go to Cholot or we give you $3,500 and you go back to Eritrea. That worked in the first two months. We had more than 2,000 people leave. Now people are not going back because the stories of what happened to the ones who went back are starting to come. How they were put in prison and tortured, how their money was taken from them. And so people do not anymore want to go back. They prefer to go to Cholot than to, to go back. Christians represent around 80% of the total group of refugees and asylum seekers. For those who survive the hell of kidnappings and detention camps in the desert, there is a pastoral centre in Tel Aviv offering support on many levels. It was founded in 2009 and since then plays a role of a church and multi-purpose meeting place for Catholics, mainly from Tel Aviv. Approximately 400 faithful attend seven Sunday Holy Masses, celebrated from Friday evening to Sunday morning at the Our Lady Woman Novala Pastoral Center. The Catechesis for Children is conducted in Hebrew, which is the language they speak at Israeli schools. Every year, about 50 children accede to the First Holy Communion, and about 20 receive the Sacrament of Confirmation. The Catholic Church must be with her sons and daughters here in this neighborhood. Many aid organizations came to our help, among them Church in Need. We decided we want to buy a place and renovate it. Not build a church, that would have taken years, but find a place that can be transformed into a church a little factory, a little workshop that we could then remodel as a church with space for pastoral activity.
Nigdy do tej pory w Tel Awiwie nie było kościoła. To jest mnóstwo ludzi. There are a lot of Catholics who would like to have an opportunity to participate in the Holy Mass or have some of a parish life, a community life. Our center is not only a place for the Holy Mass, though. Deprived of work and the means to live, immigrants looking for solutions to their problems are reaching for alcohol and drugs. We have a lot of alcoholism. In fact, right in front of our church, we have a place where people come and get drunk at night, and there's a lot of fighting and abuse of women. A uh, place, it's not a bar, because a bar sounds sophisticated. This is just a place where very poor and desperate young men go to drink themselves into a stupor to forget their terrible situation. We have a lot of drugs in this neighborhood, which leads to a lot of violence and crime. We have a lot of prostitution. Some of the children are behaving strangely because they have alcoholism or drugs at home, because, God forbid, their mother is involved in prostitution, or because they have been abused. The unregulated situation of migrants, especially that of women, the lack of permanent income, the lack of adequate medical care forces many young pregnant women to consider abortion. Abortion is a huge problem also because when a mother does have a baby, she's not always allowed to keep that baby because the baby cannot be registered. In the old days, they received birth certificates, but it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem as Israel don't want this population to be stable and to grow. Refugees and asylum seekers, when ill or sick, have no right to take advantage of any state medical care. Only some non-profit organizations provide a minimum of help. Sister Azeze works for one of them as a volunteer. We give them free treatment with uh, all doc volunteer doctors, volunteer nurses. There are many. The effect of the, um, the trauma, of the torture, it has brought also a lot in relationship with their husband, with the people. It is it's not easy to embrace themselves again and start new life. They are ashamed so much, the women, especially with sexual abuse, they don't tell to other people because they feel so humiliated. They come to me to help them to be strong on their faith and to start again, to trust in themselves that is not their fault. And most of the women want to speak to me separate. They want a bit of spiritual part. What happened to them, it was not only traumatized them physically, but psychologically. They are depressed, they are handicapped. Some of them, their legs, some of them, their hands, some of them, their, them, their mind. It is not only in the torture camp, but also the effect of it. You need a lot of great faith and the prayer. Only God can heal them. The church is present in this. So because of that, I come because the people have a light. They have a hope. They have somebody to look, to look or to share. One of the biggest problems the immigrant women have to face is the care of their babies. Coming from this very, very poor, struggling background, mothers cannot take time off to be with their small children. The scale of the problem has led Father David Neuhaus and his team to set up a care system for babies. Currently, there are 52 children being cared for by a few migrant women. This system allows mothers to work during the day. A large group, which can count on the material and spiritual support in the pastoral center in Tel Aviv, apart from the Eritreans and the Sudanese, is the Filipinos. They are mostly economic immigrants. If they can get a job, it is the hardest, lasting more than 10 hours a day and with very low income. They are answering a huge need. 
Okay, it's the need of rich people who don't want to do certain jobs. They don't take care of their poor people, they don't take care of their sick people, and often they don't take care of their children. Uh, this is a common uh, feature of a rich society. They bring in other people to do that work. So we have our slave markets and we fish for slaves. And Filipinos in the job of caregiving are extremely sought after. Uh, they are loved and sought after. These are people whose life is really focused on many, many hours of work. And the few moments of free time that they have, they want to concentrate on prayer. If the Center for Immigrants was not there, I'm sure that most of these people would not reach the church. It is about the receiving the strength for a whole week of longing for their homeland and loved ones. Often these people are very lonely, very confused, thrown into the vortex of acquiring material resources. The sacramental, catechetical, and community life is led in Hebrew. What's more, their Christian faith is confronted by the language, liturgy, feasts, and practices of the Jews. In this reality, the catechization of 150 children from immigrant families is a real challenge. The children of the community grow up completely inserted into the society. They, they sound, speak, behave just like little Jewish Israeli children. That it's a big, big struggle to introduce them into faith, because they frequent a completely secular Israeli-Jewish world. Our biggest enemy in terms of the work of the church is assimilation. Because their parents work hard, also late at night, the children are raised by the school, some by the street, Therefore, obviously, Hebrew is their first language. That's why catechesis is also in Hebrew. I was struck by the determination with which parents send their children to catechism. That desire and the gatherings become the only kids' contact with the church, with some religious education, some of them never had any real contact with any catechesis since their baptism. And all at once, an opportunity to prepare the children for the First Communion appears. So the parents very willingly bring their children over. When we start the catechesis of children, there are often some funny situations. For example, when I ask, who is our savior? The answer is, Moses, our master. They are taught this way at school. And when I ask, what saints you know? The answer is, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And slowly, our catechesis introduces them to the world of Christianity that is totally unknown to them. They know Judaism from school, whereas Christianity is something so abstract for them at the beginning that slowly we have to pierce through their ignorance. The idea is that they are able to identify themselves as Christians. I am baptized. I am a Christian. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that is my identity. Alongside the catechesis for children, the center plans to start the catechesis also for their parents. Once, one of the mothers came to me with the question, how to say the word cross in Hebrew? Then she wrote it down. So I'm also aware that not only the children benefit from this catechesis.
Children also have an opportunity to participate in the summer camps organized by the center. All these holiday trips strengthen their faith because they meet, as in the case of World Youth Day, millions of young people like them. However, being a Catholic in Israel is kind of an extravagance. The fact that in Israel there are few of us does not mean that there are no Catholics at all. And after coming back from a meeting in Europe, I see these young people transformed, less ashamed of their faith. The kids who come back home teach their parents our father in Hebrew. A Filipino mother told me that her daughter, since she came back from a summer camp, sings all religious songs in Hebrew. And she says, Father, I have learned half of these songs already, and even our father we pray together in Hebrew. Father Neuhaus also wants to make the center a place of encounter and dialogue between the two religions of Judaism and Christianity. For many Jews, a Christian was the enemy, someone who persecuted them, who did pogroms, who did Holocaust. And suddenly Christians are coming into their lives as loving hands, as soothing voices, as eyes that are watching over with great care over their parents over their sick, over their handicapped children. And so the whole image of what a Christian is, is slowly being transformed by these people. So I think that here also is a very important mission. In our center, the faithful feel that they are not alone, that someone takes care of them, that someone wants to organize and do something for them. It's so touching to see the smile and the joy of people coming out after the Holy Mass and to know that this would not take place if our center was not there.